So it's an immense pleasure to introduce a friend of mine for many, many years, Patrick Brosnan, who is going to tell us about fixed points into road of compactification and essential dimension of towers. Pat? Well, th thanks. It's a, an immense pleasure to be here, too. Although, like Christian, I wish I was actually in Miami right now. <laughs> but uh, next, I feel like next, I've been next what? year. Next, next year, year. you got that's got to be a problem because I feel ripped off, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you are absolutely right to feel so. No, just yeah. But um, so I should say I like like uh, I like the talks that I saw yesterday so much that I went and and typed them up because they were the ones I thought were on Beamer. And so I typed them up, which might, because uh, I don't know if you're going to like that, though, because I haven't been using Beamer a lot. So I hope it goes OK. I mean, I, I'm trying to imitate the talks from yesterday, which I really like, but I, I don't know if I succeeded, uh, especially since, OK. I, oh, oh, but uh, let me, so let me tell you, the one thing I did do, I posted the talk on my web page. So if you want, if you want to be able to go back and forth, you can just go to my web page and it's on, it's like right here. It's got an old picture of me. And you can just click on this and then you can go back and forth. And or, but you could also ask me to slow down or speed up or whatever. So here's the outline. Um, the, I'm gonna, there's an introduction. I'm gonna tell you what essential dimension is. Then I'm gonna tell you about some new results of uh, Benson Farb, Mark Kisson, and Jesse Wolfson that motivated the thing that I'm gonna talk about. And then I'm gonna tell you about my results with Najmuddin and Fakhruddin, which are the, that's the thing that I'm gonna talk about really. And then I'll talk about, a con I'll, I'll give a conjecture. So Najmuddin and I, we make a conjecture that's supposed to explain what's going on. Um, Okay, so here's the introduction. Uh, so essential dimension is a numerical invariant of algebraic objects. It was invented in the late 90s by Joe Bueller and Zenobi Reichstein. So roughly speaking, and I'll, I'll tell you more precisely soon, but roughly speaking, the essential dimension of an algebraic object is the number of parameters it takes to define it, say, generically. Traditionally, the main focus in the study of essential dimension has been on like G torsors for various groups G. But uh, a recent paper of Farb, Kisson, and Wolfson shows that it can be interesting to prove theorems about the essential dimension of congruence covers arising from Shimura varieties. So those are also G torsors in general for the congruence group, but it's they're kind of very special kinds of G torsors. So uh, this talk is about my work with Najmuddin, Fakhrin, and, and our, our goals were, okay, to give geometric proofs of the results of Farb, Kisson, and Wolfson, which were proved by purely arithmetic methods. So I'll say a little bit about their arithmetic methods. The second goal was to uh, extend their results by proving um, results about non-classical Shimura varieties. In particular, where we really win is for Shimura varieties of type E7. And those are unobtainable by the methods of Farb, Kisson, and Wolfson, at least with the kind of present understanding of integral models, I would say. Um, we also uh, prove results from reductions mod P of classical Shimura varieties and for certain quantum level structures of moduli spaces of curves. Um, and then the, the other goal is to point out uh, a general conjecture about essential dimension in Hodge theory. Because what's going on, we think, is part of a bigger thing in Hodge theory. OK, so I'm going to tell you what essential dimension is in a sort of non-standard way. But I should say something that. Essential dimension is one of those notions. It's almost like the notion of a matroid, where there's like 10 different ways to define it that are all basically equivalent, but they're all, um, they all give like different viewpoints on the subject. So uh, 
the way Farb, Kissin, and Wolfson work with it is basically what I want to adopt. And essentially, that's pretty close to the original way that uh, Reichstein and Joe Bueller were thinking about it. So kind of by like going back to fundamentals. So I'm going to start like with something a little non-standard, which I'll call the pullback dimension. So suppose uh, x to y is a generically finite morphism of quasi-projected varieties over C. Okay, and I put the things in parentheses that aren't really necessary, but to simplify what I'm going to say a lot. So I'm going to give you the following non-standard definition. The pullback dimension, like right at PBD of F, is the minimum dimension, dimension of a variety W fitting in a pullback diagram like this. So X to Y, Z to W. So in other words, the pullback dimension would be the smallest dimension of a variety W that the morphism X to Y can be pulled back from. Um, okay, uh, I'll, I'm gonna pause for a tiny bit, just because this was a short slide. Um, okay, essential dimension. So now let's suppose for simplicity that X and Y are irreducible. Wait, 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 wait Patrick, do you have an yes. example or? Of the pullback dimension? Yeah. Uh, do I have an example of the pullback dimension? I mean, uh, well, uh, it, not, yeah, I don't know if I really have an example of that. I don't think about that that much because it, it's only just a, um, I'm just defining it to make it easier to define a sense of dimension. Okay. But I would imagine that the pullback dimension of um, of a map from X to Y is pretty often just going to be the dimension of Y because it's kind of usually hard. Oh, maybe I do have an example. Sorry, I had an example that I wrote in my last talk, but I, it was a long time ago, so I forgot it. So if this map from X to Y is a product, then obviously the pullback dimension would be zero because you could just get the product from, you could take W to be a point, right? Now I said X to Y is generically finite. So a product of a, gen, a generically finite product, the fiber is gonna be finite. So it's not that interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what's generally gonna happen for a, at least for an, for, I'd say for an italomorphism, the pullback dimension. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, well, it's an interesting thing to study. I mean, it's got to it typically be the dimension ahead, of y. Sorry. Yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, essential dimension. It's like the pullback dimension, except we want to. Uh, we we only want to care about the pullback dimension generically. So suppose for simplicity that x and y are irreducible. The essential dimension of this map f from x to y is just the minimum of the pullback dimensions um, of, of, F, of the base change of F to U, where U goes over all the risky dense open subsets of Y. So it's the minimum of the pullback dimension of F inverse of U to U, such that U is a Zariski open subset of Y. Okay, this, this is like the main object of study in essential dimension really is what that, but um, it's kind of hard to compute in general. So early on, um, I guess Reichstein and Bueller, maybe uh, uh, um, I might be actually coming from suggestions of Sarah. I'm, I'm not sure, but they decided to uh, th that it would be easier to study if you local kind of localized at a prime p. So for a prime p, the essential dimension of f at p is okay. Well, I'll write it at f of p, it's the minimum of the pullback dimensions of x, v to v, but now where instead of having v range over the risky open subsets of y, you let it range over all generically finite morphisms from an irreducible variety v to y, but that where the degree is prime to p. Okay, so that sort of well, turns out to be a lot easier to study. Um, and I, I guess I would say that most of the conjectures about essential dimension that are still open 
are about essential dimension and not about essential dimension at P. Most of the major conjectures about it. Um, Zenobi Reichstein mm -hmm. divides things up into type one and type two problems. Type one is the things about essential dimension. Type two is about essential dimension at P. We kind of think we have a handle on essential dimension at P. We kind of don't think we have a handle on essential dimension. You, um, I yeah, Patrick, I had, a, I had a small question. So this, it yeah. occurs to me that mm, there's a similar kind of notion that people use in birational geometry called the variation of amorphism. Or yeah, the yeah. Of the family, right? But so there, so this is something that I think Vivek defined, but there what they do is they also allow you to first take a finite covering of Y before you take the Zariski open subset. So it's it's the of, same thing, pretty much. But you are, are you also allowing this? I mean, are you? Yeah, that V to Y is a finite covering. Yeah. But in this in this prime to P case, right? But when you define yeah. ED of F, you're just literally taking a. Oh, I see what you mean. So yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, it's not the same thing because I require the finite cover to be a degree prime to P. But I guess Reichstein and Duncan also do consider mm -hmm. the basically the thing you're saying, where you allow any kind of cover. Any cover, okay, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I think they do. I have to be, I have to think, I have to think a tiny bit. Cause you can get, if you allow any finite cover, you can get into something silly. So, especially with the finite map, right? Cause X to yeah, Y I mean, is already it's, finite right. then, yeah, yeah. So they, they, only, they only consider it in the case when uh, the fibers of X to Y are connected. Connect, yeah, exactly. <laughs> to the, avoid the, exactly. So in my case, right. if I did that, it would, it would just be always trivial. Yeah, yeah, right. So okay, that would be we wouldn't do that really because yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so uh, so um, so morally speaking, the essential dimension of x to y can be thought of as the uh, pullback dimension over the generic point or over the function field of y. And the essential dimension of x to y at p can be thought of as the pullback dimension of f over a prime to p closure of the function field. You, you take the, you know, you can always take a, a, a field extension of k of y that uh, is maximal among prime to p field extensions. I think I said that right. Um, Okay, so then there's a, no, a related notion of incompressibility, which is really what this talk is about. So we say that a, a map X to Y is incompressible if it's an essential dimension, it's just dimension of Y. And we say it's P incompressible if the essential dimension at P is a dimension of Y. So, okay, speaking a little bit vaguely, uh, what it means is that a morphism X to Y is incompressible if there's no pullback diagram that looks like this, you know, you have X to Y and Z to W, and then instead of having a morphism from Y to W and from X to Z, you just get to have rational maps. So it's sort of rationally pulled back. And that might be a little bit vague because I haven't defined what this means, but I think people, can, yeah, I think it's good. Um, okay. So uh, mo most of this talk is not about essential mention of groups, but since I since I want to essential mention came from thinking about essential mention of groups, so I kind of want to tell you the, the history of that. So, like I said, most of the focus uh, of a, in the theory of essential dimension is about the essential mention of groups, kind of both finite and infinite. Um, so this is a number of parameters it takes to define a G towards. So when G is a finite group or a finite algebraic group, we could define it uh, like this. The essential dimension of G is the supremum of add X over Y, where X over Y ranges all over just all G towards. So similarly, if P is a prime number, the essential dimension of G at P is the supremum of add X to Y at P, where X over Y ranges over all G torsors. And we, it's traditional to write edge G at edge G semicolon P for the essential dimension of G and of G at P respectively. There's one subtle point which I, I want to gloss over, but I'm gonna, I should gloss over, but I'll tell you anyway. Um, so if X to Y is a G torsor, you could think that maybe I need to pull it back as a G torsor 
to, but if g is finite, you get the same number, whether you think of this x to y just as a map of varieties or as a map of g towards it. So that, that's in a, that's in the fact that goes into that is actually in, the fact that implies that is actually in the original paper by Bueller and Reichstein. Okay, so here are some examples of essential dimension and um, coming, the first really are classical, but they come from the original paper of Bueller and Reichstein. So maybe the, the original motivation of Bueller and Reichstein was to look at essential dimension of the symmetric group. And that's really a question about how many parameters it takes to define a field extension. So the essential dimension of Sn is the number of parameters it takes to define a degree n field extension. So the Babylonians knew, I think it's the Babylonians, that if you want to define a degree two field extension, you just need to take a square root. We work over C. I think the Babylonians worked over, over C. So the, the, so, so the essential dimension of S2 is one because you, any quadratic polynomial, the field extension it gives can be gotten by look, just looking at the polynomial x squared plus a equals zero. So also classically, the essential dimension of S3 is one. So that, that's a tiny bit harder to think about. You know that you can reduce to the case of that the polynomial is x cubed. Maybe I'll write, I can write, I can draw. So you know that you can get x cubed. Okay, I can draw, but I can draw, draw badly. Plus ax plus b equals zero. Okay, that's ugly. But you can actually take a equals b. I guess I won't do this again. So you can actually scale so a equals b. Okay. So that being, that tells you that the essential dimension of S3 is one. And then also classical is that the fact that the essential dimension of S4 is two. And then Bueller and Reichstein point out in their paper that um, actually Klein and Joubert, they both, uh, I, I might get the history a little bit wrong, but some from their results, it follows that essential dimension of S5 is two and essential dimension of S6 is three. So it takes two parameters to find a degree five extension, and it takes three parameters to define a degree six extension. Okay, and then here are some more modern things. Uh, so Bueller and Reichstein showed that the essential dimension of a uh, finite abelian group A of rank R is R. So the the one part of that is just Coomer theory that the essential dimension of mu n is one if, if um, n is a positive integer greater than one. So Bueller Reichstein also showed that the essential dimension of Sn, it's always between uh, n over two and n minus three for n bigger than or equal to six. Then a student of Zenobi Reichstein's, a uh, uh, former student, showed that the essential dimension of S7 is four. And um, then another big result is that if you have a P group, um, G, so this is the result of Karpenko and Mercurov, then the essential dimension of G is the same as the essential dimension, essential dimension of G at P. And it's the minimum dimension of a faithful G representation. Uh, so for P groups, we have a really good handle on essential dimension. But the essential dimension of Sn is still, it's unknown for n bigger than seven. I think most people would conjecture that it's gotta be n minus three, but we, 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 nobody knows. Another major conjecture, these last three are the kind of the big, the big problems in essential dimension. Um, another big problem is the essential dimension of PGLP for P a prime. So that's an infinite group and I haven't defined it. You can probably guess, you can kind of guess what it is. It's the number of parameters it takes, takes to define a PGLP torsor. And that's really the same as the number of parameters it takes to define a degree P division algebra. And there's a conjecture, maybe by Albert, I think by Albert, but it might be Amateur or it might be somebody else whose name begins with an A, 
that every degree P division algebra is cyclic. If that was true, the essential mention of PGLP would be two, but nobody believes that conjecture. So it's, it's probable that the essential mention of PGLP is not two, it's bigger than two, and that would disprove the conjecture. But it's open, I mean, the conjecture is open. So I think it's even open for P equals five. Um, so another thing is that the uh, uh, essential mention of a cyclic P group, Z mod P to the N, over C it's one, but if we work over a characteristic P field, we don't know what it is. It should be N by a conjecture of let it, but we just, we don't know. It's, not, it's, it's just unknown. Every Z mod P to the N torsor, it comes from uh, kind of a universal Z mod P to the N torsor over the bit vectors. But then that rational, the fact that essentially mentioned is this birational invariant, like it makes it hard to, yeah. <laughs> It, it, just, it makes the question hard to answer. I mean, we just don't know. Okay, so those are the examples. And now I talk about the work of Farb, Kissin, and Wolfson. So let's write AG for the moduli space of principally polarized abelian varieties, PPAVs of dimension G. And AG bracket N is the moduli space of such things with full level N structure. So that is, AG bracket N, it's parametrizes pairs consisting of a PPAV A and a symplectic isomorphism phi from H1 of A Z mod N to Z mod N to the 2G. So I think you have to pick a root of unity to the primitive nth root of unity to make what I just said rigorous, but E to 2 pi I over N, stick it. So for n bigger than or equals three, ag bracket n is a fine moduli space. Of that. I think that's like a well-known thing. So this is like the proto theorem of Farb, Kissin, and Wilson. So they prove much, much more than this. But this is where everything kind of comes from. So let's pick an integer n bigger than or equal to three and a prime p so not dividing n. Then uh, we got we get this map for a morphism from ag p n to ag n. It's just the uh, forget the P level part of the level structure. That morphism is P incompressible. So this thing is a SP 2G Z mod P to the Z mod P to, it's an SP 2G Z mod P towards it. Maybe I'll write that. So SP 2G Z mod P towards it. And what this is saying is that you can't get it from base change from any uh, SP2G Z mod P torsor of smaller dimension. And not only that, even if you allow base, even if you allow a prime to P extension and a, and a base change, you still can't get it. Okay. And now I go to the next slide. So here's more FKW. So the, the above theorem, the theorem of Farb, Kiss, and Wolfson, is proved by arithmetic methods involving uh, integral models of AG and AG bracket N. So the main techniques are um, serotate coordinates. And in the end, it's about how an abelian variety, how abelian varieties degenerate when they go from characteristic zero to characteristic P. So let's say morally speaking, it comes from that. The abelian variety is degenerating. The, the P torsion part of the abelian, P torsion subgroup is degenerating. And that degeneration lets you say something about essential dimensions, kind of how fast you come out of that degeneration lets you say th something about the essential dimension. So the method is very flexible. So it generalizes from the case where the base is AG bracket N to the case where the base is any variety Z inside of or even finite over AG bracket N, which has a suitably good reduction mod P. Okay, which I can't I can't really tell you about that because about the details of that, because it would just be too technical. But from that, uh, FKW get the following generalization. So th this is. These are two of their theorems. 
So the first is with the notation of the previous theorem, but with mg, the moduli space of genus uh, G curves, the morphism mgpn to mgn is p incompressible. So basically just the same theorem as before, but just replace ag with mg. And the way they prove it is that, well, mg is sitting in, well, it's not sitting in ag, but there is a obvious, you know, the Torelli map. So the, and, and it degenerate, it went mg also the way it's defined over spec z. So uh, they have a nice integral model of it. So that's how they get this. So, um, okay, then the other thing that they get, I wanna be a little vague about because uh, the technical details will uh, sort of you know, take a long time, but basically they get the same type of P incompressibility results for some more varieties of Hodge type. So, and the point here is that the Hodge type Shimor varieties, they're basically the Shimor varieties that can be put inside AG or AG bracket N. And so, uh, and they have kind of a controlled reduction mod P, or at least you can imagine understanding it. So that's, that's what they, that's how they get this. Um, and maybe one thing I didn't write in the slide, but I probably should have. So uh, just like uh, what I wrote, badly here, that this map is an SP2G torsor. In the Shimura variety case, there's always a group associated to the Shimura variety, that, to the Shimura datum. And it's reasonable to try to get, uh, or like sometimes that group is defined over spec Z, or at least defined over spec ZP. And it's reasonable to try to see, uh, to prove similar things, to get a, a, a G of FP torsor. And they do that in, in these cases. Okay, so now, uh, yeah, any questions? I feel like I should pause for questions. I know I'm not, I'm not there with you. <laughs> okay, so my work with, with uh, Nasbuddin. So um, our original goal was to recover the theorems of FKW by geometric methods. So the idea which we owe to a suggestion of Zenobi Reichstein was to use the fixed point method. Uh, so in fact, what happened is there was a previous conference with a lot of the same people. And so, but it was in Vancouver and I was there uh, talking to Zenobi because I, I was at the conference. And then, but also Najmudin was writing to Zenobi and he told us to, that we, we should try to use the fixed point method. So as I'll explain below, this is a general like classical method for proving incompressibility of a G torsor by finding fixed points for an abelian subgroup of G in a suitable compactification of X. So um, you notice like for AG bracket N, it's not compact. So it, yeah, maybe the, let, let me go back to this. So neither of these two guys are compact. And SP2G Z mod P is acting on AG of PN. So what you can think of doing is compactifying this guy to AG bracket PN and finding a fixed point, maybe not for the whole group, because I think that would be impossible, but for some subgroup, for some abelian subgroup. Um, so the fixed point method is about it, it, it's about finding fixed points. You need to find fixed points for some ab abelian subgroup of G. Okay. So that's what we do. So, uh, oh, yeah, this slide is too long. <laughs> okay, so this is what we do. So this is like a, it's supposed to be a, uh, 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 an explanation of all of our results, um, but it's probably too long for one slide, but I will read it anyway. So for locally symmetric spaces, we prove P incompressibility of congruence covers whenever the associated Hermitian symmetric domain is a tube domain with zero dimensional rational boundary components. So I, I have to say something about why we need. So the zero dimensional bound, rational boundary components um, in a tube domain, it comes because we want the toroidal compactifications to have zero dimensional boundary strata. And that's these two conditions, tube and zero dimensional rational boundary component 
are really what you need to have that. Okay, now, so with our methods, we recover uh, the results of FKW for AG. So we can also extend the results to certain Shimura varieties of type E7 uh, studied by Bailey. Those are not of Hodge type. So the, um, I mean, they're not even of abelian type. If, so they're just, they're exceptional type. Um, because E7 Shimura varieties are tube type and the one that Bailey studied has zero dimensional boundary components, rational boundary components. So we win. Uh, we can recover the results of Farb, Kissin, and Wolfson for MG. Um, so that's not a Hermitian symmetric domain, but basically um, our method is general enough to recover it for MG. Also for AG and MG and finite characteristic, we can prove incompressibility. So there, the methods of Farb, Kissin, and Wolfson wouldn't work because they, they have to degenerate mod P. But if you're already mod P, you can't really degenerate anymore. Mod. It's just like you've already gone to mod P. So this, this is a, another place where we win. We can also prove incompressibility of certain quantum covers of MGN studied by, okay, and I forgot to tell you who it's, uh, I, I'm, yeah, sorry. Studied by, I think Hopgaber is one of the names. But I forgot. All the, I'm really apologize to the must must bound by 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 the coming out of physics. Okay. However, and so and this is like the big confounding. However, so FKW it works for many compact Shimura varieties, and our methods can't possibly work for these because we need fixed points, right? And if the Shimura variety is already compact. There's no way to find fixed points in any compactification. The congruence cover is actually going to be a tau. So, I mean, as long as you're in the neat case, as long as the, the congruence subgroups are neat, the congruence cover is a tau. So there's no way to find any uh, fixed points. So similarly, uh, we can't prove incompressibility for E6 type Shimura varieties. So those are not tube. And uh, so they can have zero dimensional boundary components, but since they're not tube, the toroidal compactification uh, doesn't have any zero dimensional strata. There's some abelian variety living over that uh, zero dimensional boundary component. So the problem is open. I mean, the, you know, for E6 is open. So any, yeah, any questions about what we, this, this, I mean, cause this part. Yeah, but, uh, I, I mean, can, can you do E6 by combining your E7 with uh, the methods I mean, of the other guys? I really want to, and I really tried that. And I sent like about five, e no, by, by about a hundred emails to Najbuddin and to Zenovi and uh, uh, about trying to do that. And a lot of it was wishful thinking on my part. And I think it's pretty hard. I mean, I want to, because basically you have an abelian variety. It's got like high, it's like either dimension eight or 16. I can't remember. Like sitting over mm -hmm. that zero dimensional stratum in the Bailey Burrell. Mm -hmm. And and you have a group. Um, I really want it to work. <laughs> you, the, yeah, I don't, yeah, the best answer is I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I dream of it. I, I used to dream of it every night, but you know it's been a while since we posted the paper, so I don't worry about it anymore. But I want, I'd be super happy, I, I want that to happen. Okay, so here's the fixed point method. So um, I'm gonna state the fixed point method basically in the form that it came in in Reichstein and Eusen. So it's classical, but classical means like in the theory of essential dimension, it's classical. Um, for this, uh, G is a finite group and X to Y is a G torsor. X bar is some G equivariant partial compactification of X. P is a prime and H is equal to um, uh, Z mod P to the R. It's some finite abelian P group. And here's the theorem. Suppose H has a fix, smooth fixed point on X bar, then the essential dimension of F at P is at least R. So you, you can't compress this guy. Um, so the theorem, it kind of seems like magic. It is kind of magic. 
and I'm actually not going to prove it, but uh, uh, I'll, in these notes, but I would say it's not difficult to prove once you know the following result, which is of Reichstein and Usen, and um, the proof that I'll sketch, I will sketch the proof uh, of the next result. The proof that I'll sketch is uh, Kolar, Kolar and Zabo. Zabo. Okay, so here, here's the proof. They called it the going down theorem. Uh, yeah, so they prove it, they call it going down. So, because it is kind of about going down, but it's not the usual going down. But anyway, so suppose H is Z mod P to the R and F from X to Y is a rational map of H varieties with Y proper. Then if H has a smooth fixed point on X, it, it must also have a, uh, a fixed point on Y. So you can't, um, you can't get rid of that fixed point through the image of like some, through some rational map is what I'm saying. And the, the, the proof is like really, really nice. So I'm going to give it like this. I mean, this is a proof that uh, Kalar and Sabo give at the, in the appendix to the paper of Reichstein and Eusen. It's, it's really, really cool. So, so you, it's, you notice that it's obvious for the dimension of X equals zero. And I guess really for the dimension of uh, X equals one, because, if you assume that X is smooth, then uh, if, if X has a smooth fixed point, you might as well assume that X is smooth. And then you could just extend the thing to a smooth model proper projected to X bar. So, so, you, so you can assume the dimension of X is bigger than one, and then you can blow up the fixed point. So you get an exceptional divisor like E, which is just, P to the dimension of it's Pn when n is the dimension of x minus one. But then you get a birational map. I mean, since the, this map is rational, it extends and, and this E is co-dimension one in the blow up, the rational map extends. So you get a rational map from E to Y, but then you're done by induction. So uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I like that. The the there's another way to think about it by kind of blowing up and blowing down, but this is like really clean and nice. And maybe, okay, I don't, I don't wanna prove the fixed point method, but I want to say a tiny bit about it. And it's really that um, if H has a smooth fixed point, fixed point on X bar, you, if, if, sorry, if this torsor came from something smaller and H has a smooth fixed point on X bar, then there would be a rational map from X bar to something of smaller dimension. But you see that um, that something would then have to have a fixed point. And H is acting, would have to be acting generically freely on that something of smaller dimension. But then the dimension has to be at least R because if, if, a, if a group of the form Z mod P to the R has a smooth fixed point, and we're in characteristic zero, then the dimension of the tangent space at that smooth fixed fix point has to be at least R. So it's just that it's just that a, a faithful representation of this abelian group H has to have dimension at least the rank of H. That's the dimension at least R. Okay, so uh, now I give you like uh, the idea. So Producing fixed points. Um, the, I'm going to tell you my theorem with Najbud and uh, Fakhridin, but first I tell it to you in a kind of an idea. So our goal is to produce fixed points, and I tell you like actually what our initial idea was. Our initial idea was to produce fixed points in compactifications of locally symmetric varieties using the toroidal compactifications of AMRT. So this quote works. When the zero dimensional strata in the toroidal, when there are zero dimensional strata in the toroidal compactifications, or equivalently when the domain is a tube domain and there are zero dimensional boundary components. So those are really the same thing. So, okay, now I'll tell you, like roughly speaking, the reason why it works. So when you make that toroidal compactification, you're compactifying like an analytic torus. So even though the analytic torus doesn't really act on the toroidal compactification. If the, um, if there's a, uh, if the discrete subgroup 
the intersection of the discrete subgroup with an analytic with the analytic torus does. So the congruent subgroup does. And then that would have a fixed smooth fixed point in any of the torus fixed strata. I mean, in, in the, in the, if the torus has a smooth fixed point, then that'll have a smooth fixed point. It basically has a, uh, a smooth fixed point because the, if, the, if the toroidal compactification is smooth because the torus is gonna have a fixed point. So that, that, that's like a sketch, a weird sketch of the idea. So, and what happened actually is we wrote the whole paper once in the language of AMRT kind of justifying this idea that the, the uh, this sort of the torsion subgroup of the torus will have a fixed point. And then we realized that we get, we can just generalize it. And it's cause it's a little bit annoying cause the AMRT, the hard part is gluing all this stuff together. And we realize that we don't have to worry about that hard part if we just abstractify it away. So uh, we got this theorem, which is possibly uh, a lot to parse, but I'm gonna tell it to you anyway. <laughs> so we found a nicer and more general, we found it's nicer and more general to extract abstractify AMRT with a general theorem about toroidal singularities and fixed points. Okay, for this, by a toroidal singularity S, we mean the completion of the local ring of a toric variety at a torus fixed point, I should say point. Okay, that's bad. Okay, we write S naught for the complement of the boundary divisor. So here's our theorem about it's so the theorem is about before I read the whole theorem, let me just say what this theorem does is it it produces fixed points about using local monodromy. So th that's really what it does. It so compute, produces fixed points in the compactification of a G torsor by using local monodromy. Um, so now I'll read the theorem. So, so suppose F from X to Y is a finite at tau cover which is Galois with group G. And suppose there's a map G from S naught, remember that's like the toroidal singularity minus the boundary divisor, uh, such, that the comp such that the composite, so from the fundamental group of S naught to the fundamental group of Y to G is a finite abelian group A, which is generally gonna be the case. Suppose that G uh, extends to morphisms G bar from S to Y bar, where Y bar is a partial compactification of Y. And maybe let me pause to just remark that the, the kind of crucial thing here is that this toroidal singularity S, it's, um, it's, it's, it's the completion of the local ring of a toric variety. So it's, it's an analytic type of thing. Um, so anyway, suppose that uh, uh, G extends to a morphism G bar from S to Y bar, where Y bar is a partial compactification of Y. Then any G equivariant partial compactification X bar of X, ad admitting a proper morphism F bar from X bar to Y bar has an A fixed point. So basically the monodromy of this pi one of S naught action is going to be forced to have a fixed point in any partial compactification x bar mapping down to y bar. So that, I mean that's what it says. It, it tells you that the monodromy of, of pi one of s naught is going to have a fixed point on x bar. Okay, so now I go to the next slide. Going to the next slide. Um, so uh, I wanted to. Yeah, let me, let, let me stay on this slide for just one second. So just to tell you the, the main application of words. So what we're basically going to do before I show you the long next slide is we want to apply this to the case where X to Y is a congruence cover. Y bar is the Bailey Burrell. So, and then this guy S uh, is the, um, is basically a local model of the AMRT compactor. Or we could actually just take S to be a polydisc. So one or the other, I mean, it's okay. Okay, so now here's the, um, 
here's the long way of saying wait, Apple wait, uh, uh, Patrick, can, can yeah. you go back? Yeah, sure. And but the, how much time and do X, Yeah. <laughs> and X is what? Uh, so so Y is value model of AG or something like this, and X would be X, oh uh, yeah. Uh, no, X X is just X to Y is a congruence cover of locally symmetric spaces. Mm -hmm. Y bar is Bailey Burrell. X bar is whatever, anything. We know it exists. So that, that's the beauty. We don't have to know what X bar is. But we know that there is your total business coming then. Just in the working. S. So just in the S. But so I just mean, in S this can be uh, S is a poly disk or something in your. Yeah, it could just be a poly disk. Yeah, but that's toroidal. Yeah, it's toroidal. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So that that's the beauty of it that we don't need to mess with like all the mess. Not that it's a mess, but it can mm -hmm. be a mess. You, I mean, okay, it's okay. being recorded. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, we don't we we don't have to move, mess with a global AMRT business. We just have to deal with it like locally. Or we can actually kind of just work with polydisks. The way we wrote it in the paper, we're kind of dealing with AMRT locally. But, okay, anyway, so th this is the producing fixed points, the application. We take X to Y to be a cover of locally symmetric spaces. So then D, I was going to give you some of the notation. D is G mod K, it's a Hermitian symmetric domain. Gamma is an arithmetic subgroup. Delta to gamma is a finite index, say normal subgroup. X to Y is the map D mod delta to D mod gamma. So that's a, a congruence cover with group gamma mod delta. Y bar is the Bailey Burrell compactification of Y. And then S is one of the following, like I said before, very similar objects. But one thing you could do is you take, take uh, you could just take S to be delta the R, or I guess the the completion of the local ring at zero in delta the R, but then equipped with the period map delta star to the R to Y, and then by by Burrell you know that extends to delta R to Y bar, or you could take it to be a toroidal neighborhood in an AMRT compactification of Y, but you don't need to take the whole AMRT compactification. You just need to, so you don't need to mess with like all the, you know, all the fans. You just need a cone. That's the, the main thing. Okay, so now, um, well, that's all I have to say about that. Uh, so now I want to say my conjecture. I hope I have enough time for this because this is the fun part. Okay, so we we um, we realized at some point that what's going on here, we want it to be part. It's so fun that we want it to be part of a bigger thing, and or it was fun. Some part of it was fun. So here's the conjecture. So suppose H is a torsion-free integral variation of Hodge structure on a smooth connected, say, quasi-projective complex variety B. I don't think I need quasi-projective, but I just threw that in there. Let's let uh, D denote the dimension of the image of the period map. Then there exists an integer, it's a capital N, such that if P is a prime number and N is a little n is an integer with P to the N bigger than an equal of capital N, then the essential dimension of H tensor Z mod P to the N to B, so this that at P is at least D. So maybe there's one small bit of interpretation I should make. I mean, this H tensor Z mod P to the N, it's like a finite uh, local system over B. So you could, so it's basically a algebraic variety really. And the essential dimension makes sense and essential dimension at P makes sense. And what is it really saying? It's saying that that local system cannot be gotten by pullback from something of smaller dimension than the dimension of the image of the period map. That's what, it, that's what it's saying. Um, there are cases where it could be strictly bigger than D, but you can actually, um, th those cases are kind of, so for, for example, you could have a period map where the image is zero, but the local system is still trivial, still non-trivial, but like a kind of Moebius strip kind of thing. Maybe, maybe, I don't know if I've said that right, but, 
you know, so where you have finite monotropy. But you, if you pass to a finite cover, then you can get rid of that. So essentially, the central dimension should be D. Okay, and here's our partial evidence. So I mean, it's very partial. So one is like Farb, Kiss, and Wolfson. You just take H to be the canonical uh, variation on AG and like similarly in general. So another example is our theorems for exceptional Shimura varieties. Plus our fixed point theorem can be used to get uh, weaker lower bounds in general. So, I mean, you can get something from the fixed point method um, in general uh, for a general variation. So we didn't write it down. We maybe should have written it down, but we didn't write it down, but you, you can get something. You can't get this, I think, but you can get something. But then probably the best partial evidence is that as, as Nori explained to us, if you don't, suppose you just don't tensor with Z by P to the N, right? You just take H, HZ, right? Then the conjecture sort of properly interpreted follows directly from the theorem of the fixed part. And that's the last thing I'll say, because it's fun and it's easy. So I'll say it. So I'm about to say that. So here's a sketch of Mado Nori's observation. So suppose um, U is a Zariski open in B. And a more, uh, suppose we have U as a risky open in B and pi a morphism from U to W such that the uh, integral, um, the underlying integral part of the Hodge structure um, of the variation uh, is pulled back from some local system on W. So we, when we restrict it to U, it, we get it by pullback from some local system on W. So to simplify the notation, you could just replace B with U because we didn't, weren't really assuming anything about B. And then uh, we just have that HZ is pi upper star of L, where L is pulled back from uh, pi from B to W. But then this local system underlying H, this HZ thing I should have written as HD, I'll, I'll write that in, is constant along the fibers of pi. Okay, that's bad. So by the theorem of the fixed part, the period map has to be constant along the fibers. And there's a lie there that I wanted to fix, right? It's not constant along the fibers, but it's constant along the irreducible components of the fiber, fibers. Um, so, okay. So, um, oh, maybe it is constant along the fibers. I guess it would be constant along the fibers. So anyway, by the theorem of the fixed part, the period map has to be constant along those fibers. And that shows the dimension of W is at least the dimension of the image of the period map. And that's that's kind of my talk. I, I made blank pages so I could write, but that it's like I think I'm I think I finished in the right amount of time. I might have gone over by six minutes. But um, anyway, that's a sketch of the observation. And um, yeah, that's, I don't really have anything else prepared for today, so. <clears throat> All right, let's thank Patrick. Yeah. Questions? So Patrick, yeah, I have a question for you, Patrick. I mean, suppose you were to assume that that whole Kato Nakayama Sui thing actually worked and you had fans, right? Would you be yeah. able to prove it in that case? I, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of a cool question. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, that's, yeah, that is a good question. I mean, I, mean, I don't know. Like, um, um, no, because I think we'd have the same kind of problem. I think we'd actually wind up having the same kind of problem because for Shimura varieties, we have like all the fans we want, but we're, we're still stuck at uh, needing to have zero dimensional uh, boundary components and tube domains. So, um, I, I, there probably are some special examples though where you can get somewhere um, and that would be kind of cool, I think. I mean, that's the kind of thing where if but I had a part of the thing, you were kind of saying that, um, you know, for part of it, you only needed the cone, right? And not the whole, like, there was part of your argument where you kind of localize it, right? At the Tori fixed point, right? And you only needed the cone and you didn't need like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not, but that, yeah, we don't, we only need it, but still in the, so in the Hermitian symmetric case, 
we don't need the whole mechanism of AMRT. We just need the local structure. Mm -hmm. But uh, we still can't, we still prove like a lot less than what should be true. That we still prove this a lot less than this conjecture. Because, and, and, and really the FKW uh, method, it, it seems to, in the classical Shimorva, in a, a sort of, for Shimorva is of abelian type, seems to go a lot farther. So um, it's just that they tend to degenerate mod P in like kind of always, whereas they don't always tend to degenerate over C. Like, I mean, they, they I see. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how much, I don't know how to say this. But yeah, yeah, we basically wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't be able to prove the conjecture. But it, I think it's a good suggestion because um, people, uh, I think people would really like it if someone proved part of this conjecture in the, for, on, um, for a non classical variation of Hodge structure. Uh, mm -hmm. or no, I don't know what to call it. For a, um, you know, classical is fine. Yeah, we can call it that. Yeah, I, I think it would be, people would really like it if somebody proved it using the Kato Asui technology. So uh, I would like it. And you wouldn't need all the technology because you only need something locally. You don't need to yeah. glue anything together. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? If not, let's thank Pat again. And so we'll proceed in 30 minutes with a talk by Greg.